Ladies and gentlemen, here he is today, all the way from Florida, Mr. Daniel Hopsicker. Thank you. Awesome. Great drums. <laughs> the, the Aphex twin. Thank you for anyone that caught that. Well, my name is Daniel Hopsicker, and I uh, asked myself, as I waited to come on, what I could say to you that would be most useful to you. Um, and I guess I've been asked to come up here and share my experience, strength, and hope, and what happened to me. So first, before I tell you what I found out, I'll tell you who I am, so you can judge a little bit better what, I, what, I, what I'm going to tell you. Um, I was a business produce, producer, spent 25 years living in Los Angeles, um, trying to be one of the beautiful people, which is hard to do when you're bald at the age of 25. <laughs> and um, in the late 90s, I wanted to have a second show, because I had a business show that was airing internationally on NBC. And I went out to update a silly old show that was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, aired for five years in the late 70s, called In Search Of. Extraterrestrials, pyramids on Mars, da 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 da. There was always a story in the middle that was pretty interesting and made you go, hmm, you know? So my associate producer sold me on featuring on the, what was going to be a half hour pilot uh, a story that was then called America's Most Famous Unsolved Mystery. It had been featured three, four times on that show. It's called The Train Deaths. It's about two 17 year old high school seniors who were stumbling, larking, larking at midnight in August in 1987, and they stumbled onto a drug drop and were murdered. So I got down to Arkansas to shoot this little 15-minute story. Now, and the first thing I have to tell you is that most people on the, this part of the country think that those of us from California are all wacky, okay, and in some ways we are, but I can tell you we had never heard of a drug drop before. We had never heard those two words put together. We had never heard of a place where drugs and or cash rain from the sky, literally rain from the sky, regularly. But people in Arkansas have. And what I discovered is there were people down there were afraid to talk to me. Well, nobody in California is afraid to talk. They'll talk about anything. People in Arkansas, they, People said to me, no, you don't understand. You're going to leave, and I have to stay. So I had never been in a place like that before, especially in my hometown, USA. And instead of doing a 15-minute feature on a half-hour silly pilot, TV pilot for a show nobody really needed, I did a two-hour documentary based on allegations that the CIA was trafficking cocaine through Mena, Arkansas in the 80s to fund the Contras. Imagine that. <laughs> and I took this two-hour documentary back with me with pretty much conclusive proof that that was indeed the case. And because I'm from the Midwest, there's a, just this basic naivete, okay, about those of us born and raised in the Midwest. You just never lose it. I thought somebody was going to give me a Pulitzer Prize, you know. And I gave it to my big dog friend in Hollywood who helped found HBO. And HBO at that time was running documentaries on racy topics. Um, Spike Lee had a series of Sunday night things um, on yeah, uh, racism in the South in the 60s. You know? And I thought, well, how about drug smuggling in Arkansas in the 80s? You know, there's a topic we haven't heard too much about yet, but no. And my big dog friend told me that my show would not air. And I thanked him for that because only your friends will ever give you the truth in Los Angeles, that people that don't like you just won't return your calls. So there I was sitting with a $100,000 $100, show upside down um, and nowhere to go with it, and I'm a little angry. <laughs> so I decided to write a book about the gentleman, Barry Seal, who had been most instrumental in flying drugs down to the Contras and or flying rather weapons down to the Contras and drugs back. And in fact, Barry Seal should go down in history as being the man who brought military logistics to bear on moving narcotics, which is a major industry after all. I mean, it's the number one or two industry in terms of foreign trade in the world. So if 
if every, if every drug van or drug plane out there had, you know, drug X on it, like FedEx, you know, it would be a common symbol. You'd be seeing them everywhere. And you think about it, you'd have to see them everywhere. Um, and it's an open secret, in fact. I mean, you can't. How do you hide um, from a government that can read the make your golf ball from outer space? That's our government. The biggest industry in the world today, which is the importation and sale of illegal narcotics. And the fact is, you can't. You can't. It's an open secret. And what an open secret is, is something that everybody in town knows about. About one hour in? Yeah. Everybody in town knows about, but, but nobody's willing to admit. Okay? So, um, life became interesting at that point. I made friends with people that I'd never known before. Um, some of them were spooks. One of them was a nice old guy in Newport Beach, where I lived at the time. Retired, he told me. I later learned he wasn't. But he was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. Sweet man, sweet man. I, I, he had slept with a 45 under his pillow till he was 60. And I was happy to have this guy as a friend because I wanted to know if I was, if I was going way wrong, he would tell me because he liked me. And if I was going way right, he might tell me because he liked me, okay? At any rate, I'm sitting there with a $125,000 show that I can't sell or air and grousing a lot. If only somebody had come to me and said, kid, you're getting in way over your head. Don't do this. Of course, if someone had done that, I'd have done it anyway. But now I'm saying after the fact, if only. So in a conversation, you know, I'm, I'm going to retail some anecdotes here as we go along because that's what I have to offer. In a conversation, he told me three times once, well, if they come to see you, you have to be willing to tell them what you want. He said that. You have to be willing to tell them what you want. One day he calls me up, and he has a friend he wants to bring in to meet me. And this is February in Newport Beach. It's the rainy season in California. We only have two seasons, dry and rainy. It's rainy season. But that's no excuse. This, my friend Dick brought this man, tall, distinguished gentleman, probably late 50s, early 60s. He was wearing a trench coat. I swear to God, he was wearing a trench coat. And he, my friend Dick introduced this man to me as the special advisor to the president of a large Midwestern institution. <laughs> well, later I found out that he had been, for many years, and was still at that time, the station chief in Madrid, which would have meant nothing. But I knew he was somebody, right? And he wants to see my show. So I'm showing him about a half an hour of The Secret Heartbeat of America, the show I did about Arkansas and cocaine and Barry Seal. And I'm nervous. I'm thinking, because this guy's smart and has an imposing appearance, he's going to jump down my throat. And I'm sitting there tense. And when he'd seen enough, he said, you can stop it. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and this is how smart these people are. Here's what he said. He said, everybody knows this. Everybody knows the government smuggles drugs. I was just in Costa Rica. I've loaded drugs onto planes. I was just in Costa Rica. They're doing it down. Everybody knows this. What do you want? <laughs> now what I'm about to tell you is true, and a few people that, that know me here might, might vouch that this sounds like me. What do you want? I should have said, give me my $100,000 back. <laughs> but I'm from the Midwest. And so I said was, everybody doesn't know that the government smuggles drugs. If everybody knew the government smuggled drugs, drugs would be legal. There's two million poor schmucks in prison in this country for selling basically small amounts, which you guys are bringing in by, by the train load full. So everybody doesn't know. And I said, if it's no big deal, I said, put me in charge of cocaine distribution in North America next year. And I said, I'll choose your next fucking commander-in-chief. 
I did, I did, I said that. <laughs> because that's the truth. Um, we're talking about the dark side um, of, our, of our world, of the world we live in. If you're of an age like I am, and I'm in my mid-50s, fuck, excuse my language, <laughs> you have not been allowed to know the truth about any of the major public events that have occurred in our lifetime. Kennedy assassination would be first. The Vietnam War, my dad and I fought about the Vietnam War for 10 years. 10 years after the Vietnam War, if you'd asked my dad what it was for, he couldn't have told you, nobody knew. And here we are today in Iraq. Now, why are we in Iraq? Excuse me, why? Terrorists, but there were 15 Saudis on those planes, so why aren't we in Saudi Arabia instead? You know, why are we, nobody knows. We've been there seven years, I don't know how long. You know, I mean, what, we'll be there a long time. And, you know, and also, I'd be happy if I could be, and I am cynical, believe me, I'm cynical, I'm too cynical for my own good, but if it's for the oil, that doesn't make sense. They're only pumping $10 billion worth of oil out of the ground a month, and we're spending $20 billion a month to be there. That's not funny, lady. That's, that's why we're having a recession now. So if it's for the oil, and if it's not for the oil, I don't know what it's for. Okay, so once again, I'm clueless. I am not allowed to know, and we aren't allowed to know, the truth about what's going on. So that's a little about me. Let's come to 9-11 now. Um, so I did a book about this guy, Barry Seal, that, that, I wa uh, that I wasn't allowed to have a show air about, Barry and the Boys. And I, I discovered some pretty amazing things in this. In fact, the picture on the front cover of the book is the only extant photograph of the CIA super secret assassination squad called Operation 40. And this picture was taken in a nightclub in Mexico City on January 21st, 1963. And Barry Seal, the biggest drug smuggler in American history and a lifelong CIA agent is, is on this cover. And right there, that's Felix Rodriguez, who many of you know. And this guy right here, that's Porter Goss. <laughs> this guy right here is William Houston. Well, I should have like an overhead, right? This guy right here is William Houston Seymour, who many Kennedy assassination researchers, and I'm not one, say was the second Oswald, went around saying he was Oswald to implicate Oswald. And the guy next to him, covering his face like this, that's Frank Sturgis from Watergate. For any of you that old, and I found the photograph, and I found it in Barry Seal's widow's safe, where she kept her jewels. And when the State Department sent down a seven-man cleanup squad to go through her files in 1995, three years before I got there, they didn't look in the safe, and so the picture was still there. It was a keepsake that he gave her. You know, it was in a frame from like a nightclub, Mexico City, you know. So. I'll tell you this little anecdote because it'll get, get me from here to there. Um, I was getting death threats while I was shooting that two hour documentary from people I presumed were close to the Marcello organization, which is still down there, but it was scary. I mean, I don't know, you ever got a death threat? I'd, I'd never got a death, and I was 45, you know? <laughs> well, new thing for me, death threat. And I was closing, locking windows and looking at myself in the mirror going, what did you get into here? And that was the point at which I discovered that I had inside myself this kind of like wild hair that I wanted to know at some time before I shuffle off this mortal coil, I wanted, I want to have some vague idea of what the hell was going on while I was alive. And I didn't. And I realized I didn't. And I was chubby, bald, and middle-aged, so I didn't have a lot to lose. <laughs> But on my last shooting trip, shooting that documentary in New Orleans, I was getting death threats and I felt the need, for the only time in my life, to hire, hire a bodyguard. So I called this friend Dick, this guy that had made my acquaintance, who later turns out to have spent a lifetime working for the NSA. And I said, I need a bodyguard. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. He said, call Nick. Nick. 
I called Nick. Nick did movie star, rock star security for a thousand bucks a day. And I said, Nick, I can't pay that. And he said, okay, well, I'll go for, he knew I was going to interview Barry Seal's widow and other people. And he said, I'll, I'll go down there for expenses. I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, if we get friendly later, I'll tell you. Well, now I had never met anybody like Nick, okay? Nick was special ops, special forces. He led six man patrols into North Vietnam in order to draw out, he said, regiment sized North Vietnamese military units so that we could bomb the shit out of them. And at a certain point, he got cynical enough to realize that what he was doing was just creating a demand so that we could build more bombs. <laughs> that, was, that was his part of the marketing of, of, of what was going on back then. And he was part of everything that had happened since when, when Carter sent people in to rescue the hostages in Iran. Um, and a helicopter hit a C-130, he was there. He had some hilarious stories about that. He called me one time. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit, but I, I have an hour and 20 minutes, so I'll get to 9-11 quickly. Um, he called me one time a year after I'd known him, and, and he said, I, I'd, like, I'd like to use you for something. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're a documentary film producer. I said, yeah. He said, well, that's great cover. He says, I want to go down as your assistant to this island in the Caribbean near St. Kitts. Why do you want to do that, Nick? He said, well, because there was a couple on a sailboat down there that had somehow become involved in an unfortunate incident in which one of the crewmen was murdered. And they were now awaiting trial for murder in that tiny island, and they were guilty as sin. But they were from western Pennsylvania, where their family was very, very big. I wish it had been the Scaves, <laughs> but it was. And uh, uh, people I had never heard of, I guess oil or, or coal, coal probably. So Nick had been retained by the family to go down and see what the prospects were for breaking this couple out of jail before they went on trial. And uh, I said, well, kind of, uh, what ideas do you have about that, Nick? Because he'd been down there once before. He said, well, he had three options. He was planning and presenting to him, to the family. And, and option number one was you just pass, m spread money around, and the guy walks out. Nobody's the wiser. Option two is you spread money around, somebody stands in the way, and there's a little bit of unpleasantness. And option number three, which he was really enthusiastic about, was whole island. What's whole island, Nick? Well, he said with 50 guys between midnight and 6 a.m., he could take over the island, take over the country, depose the prime minister of the country, put him in jail, take the leader of the opposition, make him the prime minister, get him as his first act to pardon the, this couple. Plus, Nick says there's a Swiss pharmaceutical company willing to sign on to build a billion-dollar pharmaceutical plant if it all goes down. Jeez, this is a world I have had no idea about, okay? I mean, I'm, I was an English major in college. <laughs> well, I tell you that because uh, um, I know a lot of things that don't make sense to me, and I'm going to tell you one now, because 9-11 happened, and I was waiting for my book to come out, Barry and the Boys. Well, I already had a two-hour documentary that wouldn't air, and three weeks before the book hit the bookstores, courtesy of High Times, um, Barry Seal's attorney, an integral member of the drug smuggling organization for 20 years, don't you know, about whom I had retailed some hilarious anecdotes in here, sued me for libel. And High Times says, we can't distribute your book to bookstores because you're being sued. Well, it made per perfect sense. So at any rate, this book was prevented from coming out in bookstores with the paperback five years later. So that was a pretty success. I've been sued four times, by the way. Uh, um, and I'll mention them briefly as we go through because I know some of you that know me think I'm probably the leading proponent of the modified limited hangout position. But if, if so, they've <coughs> we've, we've, we've gone to great lengths to sheep dip me. <laughs> So, three days after 9-11, it's on the news, but quietly. We had already heard that the two pilots that took down the World Trade Center both had learned to fly in Venice, Florida. On the fourth day after 9-11, it came out that the third pilot, a third pilot, the guy allegedly at the controls of the plane crashed in western Pennsylvania, also learned to fly in Venice, Florida. And I knew there was something hinky about that.
is my parents retired in Venice, Florida in about 1981. And every year I'd fly from LA, not every year, but almost, I was a pretty dutiful son, I'd fly to Venice, Florida to see my mom and dad and spend three, four nights. And if by the third or fourth night there I was so restless I had to go out to have a beer, there was nothing to do in that town. So why would a terrorist pilot in the last year of his life go to a town which I later discovered had the second oldest population in the entire United States? There's 220 flight schools in Florida alone. You want to spend the last year of your life with blue-haired widows or in Miami? So why weren't they in Miami? Why did they go to Venice? I knew there was something there I needed to know about. And so I drove to Venice, moved to Venice. And as I moved to Venice, drove to Venice, I stopped in Mobile, Alabama, where my friend Nick was preparing to go to Afghanistan on some unspecified, unofficial business. I hope he's, I hope he's well today. I once asked him, I said, how did you get to be Special Ops, Special Forces, Nick? What did they look for? He said it helped that he had been arrested 65 times for stealing cars by the time he was 16. So I stopped in Mobile, and I gave him a copy of Burying the Boys, which wasn't going to be in bookstores, but I was full of myself anyway because it was my first book, and I felt a little, you know, it was okay. I must have been a little too full of myself because as we began our second drink, he looked at me, and in total seriousness said, this is pretty much a direct quote, I told my buddy Sander last night, he said, you know, of course, the only reason that you're still alive is because a group of rebel intelligence officers have guaranteed your safety. I said, Nick, I didn't know there was a group of rebel <laughs> intelligence officers. <laughs> and even if there was, how would, they, I, how would they guarantee my safety? Well, later, if you think about it, I mean, that's why the CIA and the KGB agents didn't kill each other. They, you, you can't guarantee my safety, but, but if you kill one of ours, we kill one of yours. I guess that's the way they operate. You know, I have no idea whether that's true or not. I know that guy was not bullshitting me. I know he was like a pretty straight shooter. So there's stuff about the world that I could spend my whole life delving into and not really get to the bottom of it because I'm an outsider. I'm not an insider. And that's just the way it is. So, I get to Venice, Florida. Okay, so the story now is three of the four terrorist pilots on September 11th learned to fly in tiny Venice, Florida, which seems to me to have made Venice, Florida the biggest 9-11 crime scene that wasn't reduced to rubble. But when I got down there, I wasn't tripping over investigative reporters from the Washington Post to get to the bar. There wasn't anybody there. It's not as if the national press decided to ignore that part of the story, except for one guy at the Cincinnati Inquirer and one guy at the Seattle Post. There was nobody there. And, friends, that has been the biggest shock of my life. You could tell me that little green men sit behind George Bush in the Oval Office telling him what to do, and I would not have been as shocked as I was when I personally discovered that we don't have a free press in this country anymore. You know, if, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're all sympathetic to this. Whatever you do, you want to be the best at it you can be. If you're a mechanic, you want to, like, be a good mechanic. And I had always thought, if you're a reporter, an investigator, I mean, you want the scoop, man. You want to be Carl Woodward or Bernstein. You know, you want to make a movie about you. And I go down to Venice, Florida, and I started interviewing people that had known the terrorists for several years, and nobody else had been to see them. And I just can't really wrap my mind around that to this day. You know, I, I, apparently people, 
Apparently, they select newspaper reporters for their lack of curiosity. And I, I guess a friend of mine said there, there's a test. You have, to be, uh, you have to have the ability to stand there with your hair on fire while telling your audience you can't smell smoke. Thank you, you're too kind. Okay. So, I'm the only guy there, and it's tense. Okay, I wanna tell you folks, I'm proud of a few things I've done in my life. But this is one of them. I sat on an active CIA covert operation that was still running in Venice, Florida, after 9-11, and I wrote about it for two years. And nobody else did that. Nobody else picked up the stories. Here's the basic story of 9-11 that we've been told. That terrorist pilots, three of the four terrorist pilots came to learn, to learn to fly at two flight schools at the tiny Venice, Florida airport, each of which had been purchased in the year before the terrorists began to arrive by two separate Dutch nationals who had nothing to do with each other. I call that the magic Dutch boy theory. <laughs> Y'all remember Kennedy's. I get, I've lived in the South for five, I'm behind enemy lines in Florida for five years now, so I could say things like, y'all, y'all remember the Kennedy assassination with the magic bullet theory, right? One bullet that went through like seven bones. Well, this is the magic Dutch boy theory, because if you cannot stretch your mind around the coincidence of two separate Dutch nationals purchasing flight schools the terrorists shortly thereafter begin to train at, then there's something wrong with you, or you belong here. And I, I congratulate all of you, by the way, for being here. <sighs> you know, um, let me tell you, you know, um, uh, there was that old book, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, um, in some ways, I am still naive enough to believe what I believed when I was a kid, which was that this is the best country on the face of the earth. And evidence of that would be that folks like you have an in intense interest in the world around you and, you know, are not getting beaten up as you go home. Well, the flip side of that, of course, as we all know, is that our country does things around the world that, that all of us are, would be ashamed if we had to sign off on. And we have no ability to, to, to affect events on that, on that scale. So, you know, on the one hand, it's a great, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. I mean, um, in 85%, 90% of the countries on the face of the planet, someone like me would be dead by now. They do not allow dissident journalists. They don't allow people to write about things they don't want to be written about, most places in this world, but I'm alive. Uh, but I don't, I'm, uh, and I'm alive because I have no effect. <laughs> So let's keep it that way, okay? <laughs> I like selling books, but I don't want to sell too many, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, believe me, I could tell you about that because that's true. Uh, um, um, a German publisher picked up both my books, you know, that and Welcome to Terrorland, which came out later. And for five minutes, I thought, well, I'm going to be in sensation in Germany, you know? And, and I st started, you know, um, planning to meet West German film stars. There was, I can't remember her name, there was one with white hair, a singer, okay, Nina something. Anyway, um, and then I began getting phone calls from German reporters um, asking me how long I had been an anti-Semite. I went to UCLA. I lived in a Jewish fraternity, although I'm not, I married a Jewish woman. Well, anyone that's been married to a Jewish woman has little anti-Semite in them, but, you know. <laughs> and of course, I don't mean that. Um, but there, you know, I've never written anything anti-Semitic, you know, nothing. But they had spread the rumor based on the fact that some old crappy newspaper called The Spotlight had sold some videotapes of mine 
while I was down in Louisiana writing the book, and I was grateful for him for having done it because it, it, it allowed me to spend two years down there researching and writing a book. I had no, you know, I mean, does Time Warner sell cable to skinheads? Sure they do. So was I, was I allowed to sell books and tapes to, like, you know, anyone that wanted to buy them? I thought so, you know, but, you know, anyway, so even though, even though it was patently absurd that someone who had lived in a Jewish fraternity and married a Jewish woman and spent the bulk of his life in Los Angeles, the west side of Los Angeles, to boot, would be anti-Semitic, you know, they spread that rumor and they killed my book sales. Because to be an anti-Semite in Germany is like being a child molester here, okay? It's like beyond the pale. So very effectively, like that little trickle of income was like sliced right off and they're effective at that. Very effective. They're, and the truest thing I can say to you was said to me by someone I don't like and he was relating something that was said to him by someone I don't like even more. An Iran Contra operative, and I'll say his name, but don't anyone, I mean, he, he wrote about it. Like, his name is retired Lieutenant Commander Al Martin. And he threatened to speak about Iran-Contra in the early 90s. And when I asked him why, he told me it was because he hadn't received his briefcase. Your briefcase? Well, when Iran-Contra hit, he said there were 5,000 operatives out there who were immediately compromised. And not all of them had gotten their briefcase. And he was pissed because he hadn't gotten his. So he was threatening to talk. And he told me that Jeb Bush came to see him. And Jeb Bush told him what I'm going to tell you now in urging him not to publish his book. Jeb Bush said, there is no constituency for the truth. And that's pretty damn true. That's pretty damn true. People like me, I mean, I used to go to con once a year. I was a producer. I was never a big deal, but I made good money. So I don't mind being poor now, because I've had that a little bit. You know, I, I had enough of it. But um, there's no way you can make your voice heard loud enough to affect the national dialogue in any way at all, unfortunately. I found that out, because I found out some amazing things in Venice, Florida, which I'm going to tell you about now. And I'm going to start with the biggest one, which you may or may not know, and that is this. During the same month that Muhammad Atta and his bodyguard, Marwan al Shehi, because that's who he was, arrived to attend his flight school in Venice, Florida, the owner of the flight school's Learjet was surrounded by DEA agents with submachine guns on a runway at Orlando Executive Airport on July 22nd in the year 2000. And they found 43 pounds of heroin on board. It was the biggest heroin bust in Central Florida history. Now, the biggest heroin bust in S Central New Hampshire history might be no big deal, but we're talking Florida. The Orlando Sentinel wrote that it was the biggest heroin bust in Central Florida. 40, it's known, folks, as heavy weight. Nobody comes by that much heroin by mistake. And Wally Hilliard the man that owned the flight school attended by Muhammad Atta, his Learjet had made 39 weekly trips to Venezuela and back before it got busted. And when I looked into how it got busted, it was by mistake, which is always how these things happen, okay? Some little low-level guy got busted with an ounce and said, I'll show you where I get the drugs. And some little low-level DE agent said, cool, man, let's do it. And to tell you the biggest thing I have to say about what I'm doing in Venice, Florida, about what real investigative reporting is about, is I'm still writing about that. I am still writing about people that were involved in that bust. The co-pilot on, well, on, on Wally Hilliard's Learjet, the man that owned Huffman Aviation, the co-pilot on that plane's name was never mentioned in any DEA affidavit or in any court transcript. His name is Michael Francis Brassington, and I was told his name wasn't mentioned because he was a DEA agent from Guyana. Well, he's from Guyana, but he wasn't a DEA agent. 
because he's involved in a major scandal currently in Florida. His father, you want to know where this, okay, this plane, so I'm, what I'm telling you folks, where does heroin come from? Thank you, thank you in the front. Well, I mean, this is not brain surgery, is it? Muhammad Atta shows up, the flight school owner's Learjet's busted with 43 pounds of heroin, couldn't have anything to do with Muhammad Atta being there. Shit. So, you know, one overarching explanation for 9-11 and for the cover-up that, that we all agree occurred afterwards is that elements of the United States government were engaged in a dirty business with Osama bin Laden be, up till September 10th when he may or may not have double-crossed his U.S. partners, okay? The typical deal, according to a source of my friend Sandra Hicks in New Jersey in a case that came out, the typical deal with terrorists is oil and heroin for guns and training. Well, they were getting training in Venice, Florida and in Naples, you know, and, and there's the heroin. I don't know where the oil was, but, you know, it was a deal there, okay? And nobody's feet have been held to the fire for that, and I am so upset by that. Nobody lost their job. Nobody's in prison for allowing these terrorist fucks to be in this country. Now, I have a different opinion than ma many, maybe most of you, and so I'm not going to go into it seriously. I'm happy to talk about it, but I'd rather focus on what we agree on than what we disagree on. And one, the one thing I, I, I want to be real positive about and I want to urge you all to think about is like becoming investigative journalists. I mean, look at the Internet today. The Internet was going to save us, and in a certain way, some ways, it's good. In some ways, we wouldn't all be here if we hadn't banned it first somehow on the Internet, okay? But look at it today, okay? It's, um, it's an okay corral filled with opiners, okay? People with opinions. And my dad always told me that we're opinions, well, I mean, it's a rude expression. Most of you know what it is. Um, everyone has one. Where is the investigative journalism? We all agree we're not getting it in our newspapers. You know, this guy I was telling you about, this old guy in Newport Beach that brought this other guy to see me, you know. I see him when I go out there. I like him. I was having coffee with him one day. He's retired. He says he's retired. And he was just musing out loud. He said, you know, I don't know when it was when newspapers stopped reporting what happens every day. And you know what? That's why we're all here. If our newspapers reported what happened every day, there would be no need for a 9-11. There would be no need for people like us. It would have been pushed through to a conclusion. And let me tell you, right now, we all agree there's no been, been no serious 9-11 investigation, but if, if those, again, those of you old enough to remember Watergate, if there was ever a Watergate-style hearing with some like modern Sam Irvin at the gavel and the first person they called was Wallace J. Hilliard and the first question they asked was, you retired at 65 to Florida and a year later owned two flight schools training terrorists plus 30 to 40 world-class jets, what did you need them for? Things would happen. And I'm not going to discuss our differences, but I'm going to say this. One of the best writers alive today is a guy named pa Thomas Pynchon. You probably all read something of his, Gravity's Rainbow. And he said, and this is his quote, if they can get you to ask the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. So to me, 9-11 is a murder investigation. There's 3,000 murders, sure, but it's a murder investigation. It's not some question of ontological reality, and, you know, um, you know where, there, where there are mirrors on the backside of the moon, you know, and all of that crap. Because 3,000 people died. That's not right. You're not allowed to spin fantasies about something in which 3,000 people lost their lives. You're not a, 
not allowed, as far as I'm concerned, you know, to like create Mormon religions or be, or you know, Thetans and Scientologists when 3,000 people died on TV in horrible ways. Probably the first thing that pissed, can I say pissed me off? I, I don't want to offend anyone here. I truly don't. Um, was that they cut away from that. I read a book. I'll tell you this one anecdote. About, about how serious it is, uh, about first responders. Uh, someone was here, and there, there was a book of interviews with first responders, including one guy that got uh, uh, emergency tech that got to the plaza um, before either of the buildings had fallen. And there were people, like, strewn all around the plaza. And he went around doing triage. And apparently what triage is is you give chips you lay, lay a chip next to a person, and the color of the chip is your impression of whether they can be saved or not. And there was this one lady there laying in the plaza. Only She wasn't a lady anymore. She was only there from, like, here up. But she was alive, and she was conscious. And she had fallen out of one of the planes. Feature that. So, my understanding of a homicide investigation is that what the homicide investigator does is he goes out and he knocks on doors and he interviews the next door neighbors and the relatives and the business associates of the perps or the suspected perps find out who they were, to find out what they were doing. Nobody did that except me, and I'm nobody, believe me. But what I did find out, find out was amazing. The first thing I did, I, I was relying on a friend of mine's cynical dictum that the only real news you get about anything big that happens anymore comes out in the first 72 hours before they get the cover story straight. So I went down to local county library, and I read the physical hard copies of the three or four local newspapers in the Venice, Florida area. Terrorists were training all over southwest Florida, from Naples in the south to Venice in the north. Why were they there? Well, because the west coast of Florida is sleepy. There's nothing but old people there, right? I mean, you know, Miami, they had the cocaine wars, and, and you know, and everything got very tense down there. And, and now, when they want to run an op, it's southwest Florida that they run it in. And I'll tell you something, okay, for those of you who believe that 9-11 was an inside job, probably the majority of you, this will support that opinion. Strangest interview I've ever done in my life was with the sheriff of Charlotte County, just south of Venice, and his immediate predecessor, the major, now, Mohammed Adda spent quite a bit of time in Charlotte County, at the Charlotte County Airport. In fact, the sheriff of Charlotte County, before being muzzled by the FBI, was given emails that Mohammed Adda had written. Mohammed Adda had an email list. And the sheriff released the emails. I got, an e I got, a, got, got copies of the emails. They're printed in my book. And the interesting thing about those emails, that email list of his, is that several of the people on Mohammed Adda's email list um, work for U.S. defense contractors here and in Canada. And I never got to track down those people fully because I was restricted financially to the immediate Venice, Florida area. Um, there were all kinds of things that I found interesting that I wanted to investigate and couldn't in the book and have, have since. For example, the story of 9-11 to me starts in 1992 in Cairo when a 24-year-old college graduate who didn't have good enough grades to get into grad school in Cairo was recruited by a West German couple who have no name to come to Germany and to live with them and to attend college there, graduate school, at one of West Germany's better graduate schools 
and he couldn't get into grad school in Cairo. But he lived free in Hamburg, and he was paid for with our tax dollars because I discovered that he, um, in, the West, in the German press, I don't know if you've, not many of you read Frankfurter Allemand. I know I don't. But um, Mohammed Atta, for four of the seven years that he was in Hamburg, received money from the Congress Bundestag program, which is a joint pro program of the US Congress and the German Bundestag to recruit promising engineers from around the world and to bring them to Germany, to bring them to the US. Um, the US arm of the Congress Bundestag program, the CDS, um, the prominent members are David Rockefeller, Bill Clinton, who's a big fan, Henry Kissinger speaks at their annual meetings. So Muhammad Atta got money from these people for four years. He spent six years, seven years in a two-year graduate program. What the hell was he doing? Okay, that's where 9-11 starts to me. Who recruited Muhammad Atta? Muhammad Atta would be in Cairo today if somebody in West Germany had not said, you come with me. We're not allowed to know their names. The Chicago Tribune printed an interview with this couple and never identified them. I thought it was who, what, when, where, why. You know, they forgot the who. It's true. I mean, you know, it, it's, a lot of this is funny because it's so sad. It's funny. So um, then he comes here. Well, I went back and I read all the clips from the first couple weeks after 9-11 from the local newspapers where people knew terrorists. People knew people that had been, that had, you know, that, that, that were now said to be dead, who had lived next door, smoked pot, done cocaine, okay, slept in sleeping bags, been untidy, whatever, the next door neighbors. Who among you have heard interviews on TV from these people? Nobody. Why not? Because the FBI went around and told them all to keep their mouths shut. The first, the newspapers, three newspapers, two days after 9-11, printed that Muhammad Atta had an American girlfriend, had lived with a girl named Amanda Keller for a couple months at the Sandpiper Apartments across the street from Venice Airport. Amanda Keller, a stripper, a pink-haired stripper. She was 19. Boy, you know, I spent six months tracking her down. Well, first, the, 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 all, all three articles quoted local people, the next-door neighbors, the apartment managers, the postman confirming Muhammad Atta had an American girlfriend named Amanda Keller. When I finally did track her down, she wasn't eager to, be, to talk to me. She had moved to a Midwestern state to get away from any questioning at all. The only quote in the newspaper from her before she disappeared was, I can't really say anything. I'm afraid I'll get in trouble. So it took me a, a good bit of, uh, I, you know what, it would take in somebody at the Washington Post two days. It took me six months to find her. And when I found her, she confirmed everything that had been in the newspaper. She lived with Mohammed Hada for two months. They had gone to Key West together on a wild three-day weekend with Peter and Stefan and Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Those aren't German. Uh, those, aren't, those aren't Arab names, okay? From her, I, just, I found out that half a dozen of Muhammad Atta's closest associates while he was in southwest Florida weren't Arabs, but were German and Swiss. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah, uh, let me skip forward here just to confirm that, okay? Because Amanda Keller, later pressure was put on her, and she said, well, no, I made a mistake. I really, it was my bad, she said, okay? I mean, the Saris, okay, there, there are a couple newspapers in Florida that make a point of, like, dogging me, okay? And the local Sarasota Herald Tribune is one because they had terrorists right there, and they never did a thing with it. I mean, they could have won a dozen Pulitzer Prizes, you know, by covering the hell out of it and interviewing everyone in town that had anything to do with them and bringing the results to the American people. But they didn't do that. And because in a small way I did, I became a threat to them and they go out of their way to, to, to knock me. And so finally on their five, fifth year 
anniversary of 9-11 coverage, they called me and they said, well, we'd like your comment on, on Amanda Keller having told us that you paid her $5,000 to say that she was Muhammad Atta's girlfriend. And I said, I don't have a comment on that, and if you print it, I'll sue you till the day I die. Because they didn't want to make the serious allegation. They just wanted it in print. So that 20 years from now, someone could say, well, you know, what about that? No, 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 it's all been discredited. He paid her $5,000. Truth of the matter is, I didn't have $5,000. Truth of the matter is, is that if I'd had $5,000, I could have, I could have, um, um, I had, I drove to the Midwestern state in the middle of winter in, I think, a 1984 Audi. I could have upgraded to a merely 10-year-old car with $5,000. So they didn't want, they knew that was a ridiculous allegation. They, they, I don't even think she said it. I, they never showed me anything that said that she did. They just wanted to put it on the record because they're doing the same thing in 9-11. They did the Kennedy assassination. They have a cleanup crew involved, cleaning things up. Muhammad Atta was reported two days after 9-11 to have drunk the night before the attack or two nights before the attack at Shuckham's Bar in Hollywood where he had a half a dozen vodka tonics um, said he was a pilot for American Airlines, left a $50 tip, and both the waitress and the bartender were quoted to this effect, okay? Well, three weeks later, it, w it was like all a big mistake, okay? Muhammad Atta had been drinking cranberry juice that night. What I discovered the FBI had done in Florida was go around and intimidate witnesses. They, um, uh, I walked into the, but they weren't interested in finding, uh, apparently they knew everything already, okay? And actually, I'm not surprised uh, if that's how they felt because because y'all heard um, that there were FBI agents at 2 a.m. the following morning after the attack, less than 24 hours after the attack, going through the records at Huffman Aviation, okay? 18 hours later. Well, what I heard from an employee at Huffman Aviation, an executive at Huffman Aviation, is that at 10 a.m. on the morning of the attack, or no, 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 by noon, by noon on the morning of the attack, there was a white van parked outside of his house with FBI agents in it, monitoring his phone calls. So four, I mean, it takes these guys four hours to like tie their shoes. A week after 9-11, FBI Director Robert Mueller admitted in a press conference that the FBI knew the terrorists had been training at U.S. flight schools. But nobody asked the question. I mean, thought to ask the follow Why, if you knew there were terrorists training at flight schools, hadn't you done anything about it? And he never said. Well, I know why now. It's because they were protected. They knew they were here because they were making somebody with access to the levers of power in the United States government, a lot of money. Wolfgang Boringer from Naples, Florida, had come over here in 1997 and illegally opened a flight school. Foreign nationals aren't allowed to own American registered planes, let alone flight schools, but he did. And Amanda had told me that once Wolfgang showed up, he and Mohammed were inseparable. They went everywhere together. They got thrown out of Hooters together, you know, this, that, blah, 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 blah. Wolfgang Boringer. He was living when I found him in Atlanta. Nice, big, split-level house on a cul-de-sac in Atlanta. I was, somebody was talking about Israeli art students earlier. Um, there were a couple of Israelis um, busted with some old furniture. They said they were furniture movers, but they really weren't, um, in somewhere near a power plant, Tennessee. And I went up to, like, poke into that a little bit, and on the way back, I stopped to see Wolfgang in Atlanta. I went back to Florida. And um, he wasn't home, so I left my business card in his door. And an hour later, he was on the phone with me, screaming. And his wife was on the other line, and she was screaming, too. And he was demanding that I turn around and drive back to Atlanta so that he could have me arrested. He didn't say why. But he was using a tone of voice that I had come to know by that time is part of agent's training, 
Okay? If you're going to be a spook, you have to know how to intimidate civilians. Okay? If only to hold them in place for 30 seconds, you have to have, you know, you know the way the cops go, halt? You have to have that, that voice, and he did. So, Wolfgang Borenger, I never, there, there were so many threads to 9-11, I never got to the bottom of them, and Wolfgang Borenger was one of them. And then I began to get emails from people living on a tiny island in the Pacific with less than 100 permanent residents and no electricity. These are surfer dudes from California living on Fanning Island in the Kiribati Islands. And Wolfgang Borenger had sailed in on a 45-foot yacht with a chest full of crisp $100 American bills, and he was planning to build a flight school there. But not just any flight school. This flight school was going to teach flight students to fly only one kind of airplane, DC-3s. Does everybody know what DC-3s are used for? Short takeoff and landing, they can land on dirt strips. They're perfect drug planes. They're perfect, well, they're perfect for weapons. They're, they're, they're used all over the world today. So these folks on Fanning Island became a little nervous. Wolfgang had, a, had automatic weapons with them along with the crisp $100 bills in a chest. And so they got in touch through the president of the Kiribati Islands with the FBI in Honolulu. Well, apparently the FBI in I office in Honolulu is not one of the clued in FBI offices because an FBI agent actually took action and looked into them. And very soon thereafter, the FBI put out a terror alert in the South Pacific for Wolfgang Borenger based primarily on the testimony of Amanda Keller, who, who a lot of people, the government would love to this day to discredit. And my book. Well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, me. I'm not that important. I would like to be that important. I would like to tell you how important I am. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so my friend Sander Hicks was part of this story because he was there in New York when they caught him. Now, we had a friend, who I'm not going to name, who's a 9-11 researcher, who's been uh, a, a researcher for a number of years, and she's very bright, and, and she occasionally works with, um, with um, the CIA. And, uh, you know, you may think that's good, you may think that's bad. I don't particularly have any opinion about it. She, she, she's uh, been on the side of the angels in anything I've ever seen her in. But she was with a JTTF agent, Joint Terror Task Force agent, in his car riding around in New York City, when he received a call on his speakerphone telling him that they had apprehended Wolfgang Borenger and that with the first five words out of his mouth, he had gone from being a three in terms of F FBI interest to being an eight. And what Wolfgang Borenger told the people that apprehended him was, you can't arrest me, I'm with the CIA. And I heard that from this friend of mine who had been a researcher I'd been working with for years. And the next day, she denied it had happened. Probably for good reasons. She, had her own, she has her own reasons, and, and, and there may well be. But I, I'm devoted to the truth, okay? I, I, I care about the truth. Um, <laughs> so... Um, and that's a true story that resonates to this day because Wolfgang Borenger's out there and anybody that gets to Wolfgang Borenger could find out a hell of a lot more about 9-11 than, than, than all of us know together because he spent every day with Mohammed Atta. They were like this. They were like brothers. They knew each other in Germany. I can't tell you what that means, Okay. I mean, if you ask me what 9-11 is all about, I can't tell you because I don't know who Wolfgang Borger was working for. I just can't tell you. I mean, I'm still, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do what a reporter does is just go from, from X to Y to Z. And, you know, uh, 
uh, build by accretion. But I do know that people involved in the story, you know, are, are active today. He's one of us. He's one of ours is what, is, what, is what we heard. That's why we were not to speak of Wolfgang Boringer anymore. He's one of ours. Well, if he's one of ours now, he was one of ours undoubtedly before 9-11, and, and if he was hanging out with Muhammad Atta on a daily basis, undoubtedly the, the, the truth of the matter, whatever it turns out to be, is not what they've been telling us. And doesn't that just chap your ass? Wouldn't you like to know for once what really happened? So Sander writes this story. Sander quotes me when I'm at my most extreme. Um, he came to Venice with his very much pregnant wife. She was eight months pregnant. I thought it was, I, I felt like an innkeeper in Bethlehem. <laughs> and he interviewed one of the two magic Dutch boys who, had re who, who to me was a thug, had in attempted to intimidate me physically. He'd received training at some unspecified U.S. military base in Missouri. He kind of looks like an SAS agent, okay? Well, you know, what does the CIA do when they want to be active domestically and they don't want their fingerprints on something? What do they do? They bring these guys in. They bring these guys in. Rudy Decker's the guy that ran the flights. So Rudy Decker's is our source for everything we're supposed to know about 9-11 because he was all over TV on every TV show imaginable the week after saying, you know, what he knew about them. Oh, these guys were terrible. We didn't, couldn't wait to get them out of our flight school, blah, blah, blah. And we never saw them after they left in December of 2000, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was having dinner, according to a cab driver who was a U.S. Navy veteran and no, no nut, having dinner with Mohammed Atta two weeks before the attack. Who would like to question him about that? He's an international criminal. He was wanted in his native Holland when he was on Larry King. And doesn't that chap your ass? So um, Sander here goes and interviews Arnie Krutoff, one of the two magic Dutch boys who I thought was a thug. And he comes way impressed. He's calling me on his way back to New York. I liked the guy. He was really, he really seemed like a nice guy. And I think, I think he really regrets what, I, I'm putting this too strongly. <laughs> But, I, you know, apparently I screamed at Sander through the phone because he quoted me in his book, and it must have been a, a, an accurate quote because I know him to be, to be a, a good reporter, that I said, it doesn't matter what the fuck you think about this guy. He was, he, he's a, a covert operative in an operation that killed 3,000 people. And in this Wolfgang Boringer thing, he handed me something yesterday, a story he wrote in New York, and he's quoting me again. And he's quoting me, and I'm going to read you this because... Um, because I didn't know anyone knew I'd said this or wrote this, Hopsicker Phil betrayed. In an email to a JTTF source, he said, perhaps y'all are unaware up there that I haven't spent the past five years in Venice, bumfuck Florida, because I have a fetish for blue-haired widows. I'm the person who discovered that Muhammad Atta had a close German associate named Wolfgang Boringer. If nobody there feels that I deserve to be briefed on this story, please pass on my cordial fuck you to all involved. I don't have too many inside sources, <laughs> okay? Um, I find out what I find out by talking to people, and usually they tell me that someone has been, well, often they tell me that someone is, the apartment manager that rented to Mohammed Atta and Amanda Keller is a 65-year-old crusty ex-Marine with a tattoo of an of a, of a anchor on his arm, okay? That's who this guy is, and he was pissed because the FBI intimidated him. And he said, nobody likes being told they didn't see what they know they saw. Then their next door neighbor in Venice is married, she was a sweet lady, she was married to a Maytag repairman. Does it get more normal than that? And she told me that someone from the FBI visited her weekly for six months after 9-11 you're not talking to anyone, are you? 
And it was a year after 9-11 that I finally got to him, okay? Uh, so, I mean, things had settled down. Um, I had been visiting my folks in Venice, Florida for 30 years and never seen a cop. The first day I was in Venice, Florida after 9-11, I got pulled over twice. And the second time, I said to the officers, you know, you, I'm an investigative journalist in town. My parents live here. I said, do you think I had to stop in and say hi to the chief? And he allowed that that might be a good idea. And I'm glad I did. Because I walked in the Venice Police Department, and I spoke. I didn't speak to the chief, because he sent out his public affairs lieutenant. And I'm chatting with this guy. And I, I said, you know, all I want to know, can you tell me, all I want to know is does Rudy Decker's have any local priors, any local arrests? Oh, and this guy shot me the most pained look. You know, cops are simple people, okay? The world is black and white. I mean, they're simple people. God bless them. You know, I mean, and, and you know, f f the good and bad, you know? Um, but a pained look, and he said, you know, I'd love to tell you about Rudy Decker's priors, but the day after 9-11, the FBI came and loaded two rider trucks right out there on the driveway, and they pointed outside, and took all of our files. Didn't copy their files, took their files on 9-11. Anything to do with 9-11. And he said, then those two trucks, rider trucks, drove onto a C-130, parked on the runway at Sarasota International Airport where they took off for Washington, D.C. with Jeb Bush aboard. I was unaware at that particular moment of the governor of Florida's national security responsibilities. But that was a story I was told by a local cop. Later, after it was See, I was there early enough for the stuff I was turning up to have made a difference. If it had come out three months after 9-11 that the owner of the flight school was running heroin into this country in massive amounts, things might be different today. Sadly. I didn't know it three months afterwards. And by the time I did know it, you know, and, and I'll th when John, uh, JFK Jr. founded George Magazine, they held a, pr held a press conference. And a reporter asked him if he was planning to use the magazine to investigate the murder of his father. And he said no. And, and what he said is really poignant. I've been thinking about it ever since he said no. He said, he wasn't, he said, too much time had passed. He said, time is the great enemy of the truth. <laughs> Sadly. So, What was going on in Venice, Florida? What was going on? What is 9-11 about? I don't know the whole story. I do know part of the story. I do know that elements of the United States government were trading, were, were doing dirty business with presumably Osama bin Laden because heroin comes from Afghanistan. I do know that any prosecuting attorney worth his salt would have made the connection between the arrival of Muhammad Atta from Afghanistan. Rudy Deckers did say that Muhammad Atta was from Afghanistan and the 43 pounds of heroin found on his plane. I still find things out. I mean, I've got two new chapters in Welcome to Terrorland and two new chapters in Burying the Boys, so I keep adding things. I eventually met the pilot of the C-130 that flew to Washington, D.C. with the ref records of Huffman Aviation. I can't tell you his name because he won't allow me. And that's part of the rules of the game. You know, I'll talk to you, but it's on background. You can take it or leave it. What he told me is that C-130, with Huffman Aviation's records and Jeff Bush on board, never made it to Washington, D.C. 
How fucking scary is that? In other words, the FBI never got those records. And I was shocked because I'm, I'm easily shocked. I mean, I, I, didn't the FBI say anything? You know, he said, no, it's all business. It's just business. You know, I, um, you know, I passed that on for what it's worth. But he also told me something pretty interesting, um, which is that the 39 weekly flights of that heroin jet from Venezuela owned by the man who trained Muhammad Ada to learn to fly, um, were met each time in Teterboro, New Jersey, by a representative of the Russian mob from Brighton Beach named Felix Igor Rabayev from Tashkent. I don't think anybody's heard his name come up before. Michael Francis Brassington, who was the co-pilot on Wally Hilliard's plane that got busted by mistake and whose name didn't appear anywhere, is the son of a special advisor to the president of Guyana for privatization. And five years ago, Michael Frass Francis Brassington's father cut a deal, a billion dollar bauxite deal with the biggest Russian mobster alive. A man by the name of Oleg, I can't even say his last, De, De Pashara. You know, I, I didn't want to investigate the Russian mob. You know, but there is one person out there who I don't even know who came at this from someplace I didn't come from who reached the same conclusions. And her name is Sybil Edmonds. And she said that the State Department has been covering up an international network trafficking in drugs that was associated somehow with 9-11. And that's what I saw. That's what I found. Completely from another angle. The Russians, by the way, because I'm just moving around, it's anecdotal now, um, had what they called the aluminum wars in the 1990s. Aluminum apparently is a strategic mineral in which Russia controls most of the world's supply. And Russian mobsters fought three separate wars for control of that particular industry. And the guy that ended up owning it is the guy that cut a deal with the father of the co-pilot on the plane with Wally Hilliard's 43 pounds of heroin. Oleg D. He's 37 years old today and he's worth $28 billion. 9-11 um, and transnational organized crime is a, a fertile topic for somebody. Because this is the big dirty secret that we're not allowed to know. Um, there was a point at which I realized that unless something happened to change things, it was going to be a long time. See, there's this fertile crescent of states that are affected by the drug trade in the southeast from Florida around to Texas. Because that's where the drugs come in. And they've been utterly corrupted by it, as who could not be, as it's done everywhere else in the world. And I, at a certain point, I realized that it was going to be, a, you know, as long as that continued, it was going to be a long time before we ever had a president of the United States that wasn't a southern governor first. So what I have to offer you folks is in the form of a question I asked my friend the spook in Newport Beach one day. I said, how come it's so easy for me to like figure this out? It's writing in corporation papers. I'm a business journalist. I mean, that's what I used to do, sift through stuff like that. How come it's so easy to spot? And he said, deflating my ego, um, he said, because they don't even bother to hide it. 
Well, if you control the press, you don't have to bother to hide it. But if it's there and I can find it, you can too. Because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, despite what I might think. You know, I, I half seriously think what we need um, is for a lot of social activists to become investigative journalists. You know, a major author, and I'm not one, came and spent a month with me in Venice just before Christmas. And he's doing a book for Random House next year, and it will contain confirmation of most of the stuff I've just told you, only he won't mention my name very often, <laughs> which is okay. I'm okay with that. But um, I asked this guy, what would have happened if he, if instead of seven years after 9-11, he had shown up seven weeks after 9-11? Things would be different. So we have to, we have to, and I told him, because uh, he, he wanted everything I had and I was happy to give it to him, and then I told him, I said, you go to Hamburg and you find out what Mohammed Atta was doing there for six years, and you come back and you tell us. And somebody asked me earlier, what, what about Mohammed Atta and Port Smith? Uh, uh, Portland, Portland, Maine, where was he? Portsmouth or Portland? I don't know. But it's pretty odd that he was there. What I heard anecdotally was they had a girlfriend there. I mean, one of y'all could have gone and found out. It wouldn't have been that hard. You could have gone to the motel and you could have talked to the same people the FBI talked to. Did he have any visitors in the room? And we might have some pretty interesting stuff to tell today. The biggest thing I wanted to find out about 9-11, see, I was, I was stuck in Venice, which was fine. But the biggest story about 9-11 that I found of interest that I wasn't able to pursue was in San Diego, where an FBI confidential informant housed two of the terrorists, who Senator Hicks was talking about earlier, and somehow neglected to inform his FBI handlers who he had living under his roof. And this man was identified in every newspaper article that's been written about him, and there's been a bunch because Florida Senator Bob Graham made a point of it. He was identified in every story about it as a retired English professor at San Diego State. Well, is there anything more harmless than a retired English professor from a second-rate state college? It's not. A buddy of mine died in Newport Beach, and I went out for his funeral, so I was there anyway. I went down for three days to San Diego, and I discovered that this guy who was an FBI confidential informant that housed two of the terrorists, he wasn't a professor of anything. He had never taught at San Diego State. He had bought a phony online degree from the same place that John Gray did, the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, a book you'd have never heard about if not for CIA fixer Adnan Khashoggi, who purchased John Gray a long time ago. And that this FBI confidential informant named Abu Sattar Sheikh, that uh, Abu Sattar Sheikh wasn't even his real name. When the Joint House-Senate Intelligence Committee investigation into 9-11 attempted to subpoena this man to find out, ostensibly on our behalf, what the fuck was going on in San Diego, the FBI refused to deliver the subpoena. What does that say about separation of powers. And of course, you all know there's 26 blank pages in the Joint Intelli Intelligence Commission report. Um, would, would that the 9-11 Commission had taken a cue from them and printed 450 blank pages rather than what they did print. 
But there you go. So it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, folks. We're all here, and none of us is going to get mugged on the way out. Uh, I don't think so. Um, but our government, which is just so powerful around the world that, that you know, we can't imagine, uh, those things every day we're not allowed to know about. And that's the trade-off. Apparently, the deal we have with our government is they'll leave us alone if we leave them alone. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not such a bad deal. In a lot of countries, people would be happy to take that deal. And it's only when you see people hanging out of windows that it becomes unacceptable. Play my move. Okay, sure. Uh, all right, I'm gonna. Uh, would you like to see five or ten minutes of an unedited interview with Amanda Keller? The the one thing. There's, well, I don't want to prejudge you, but what what you'll see clearly. I mean, this this was not for broadcast. This was just so I didn't have to take notes. And what you'll see clearly is that this girl's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, um, and that she couldn't be lying. If she, there's no possibility she could be lying here. Go ahead, play it. At this apartment building across the street from the Venice airport in Venice, Florida, Muhammad Ali lived for two months with an American girlfriend, Amanda Keller. A lot of people said so. The apartment manager and his wife said so. The next door neighbors said so. The postman said so. Local reporters said so. It was on the local news. Then Amanda and the story disappeared. Finding Amanda was one of the highlights of our two-year-long investigation into the terrorist lair in Venice. We thought that by now, Diane Sawyer or someone else living in Disney Time Warnerland would have done Amanda's story. Since they haven't, we'll offer what we have from videotape rolled for documentation during our interview with her at an undisclosed location. Ada and Amanda met when he came into Papa John's Pizza in Venice, where she was a manager. Things had not been going very well for the then 20-year-old Amanda Keller, who was getting out of yet another bad relationship when she met Mohammed Ada. I was already working at Papa John's. I, was, I had worked as a manager at um, Taco Bell in Port Charlotte and McDonald's in um, Port Charlotte. So Muhammad comes in and I'm standing there flipping dough, covered in dough, you know, baseball cap on, hair pulled back into a ponytail, you know, probably my ultimate worst. And he, was, he asked um, one of my employees to have me come over and wait on him. And so I did, and I went over there, I'm like, can I help you? He was like, do you know how pretty you are? And I just looked at him kind of funny, I'm like, you gonna order a pizza or what? I know he went to Naples and Fort Myers all the time. The car that he rented was always out of Tampa. He always rented cars out of Tampa. Did he have a... Uh, uh a, pl a p Pontiac? A red Pontiac? A red one, a green one, a white one. They were always Pontiacs. I think it was Grand Dam. Yeah. But they were, there was a red one, a white one, and a green one. You're kidding. Mm -hmm. You never asked why so many different cars? No. No. Why, why? Super, why don't you just buy a car and be cheaper? Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Instead of renting Did you it. tell us the FBI? Yeah. They didn't look at, they, they sounded like they knew it already, though, right? Yeah, and they told me that it wasn't this. They had, I was absolutely convinced that the Muhammad that lived with me was an absolute different Muhammad, and it was just coincidence that they were so much alike. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That's, that's why when you called me, I'm like, no, I don't think so. They convinced you that you didn't see what you saw, except everyone around you who they didn't convince knew what they'd seen. She knew it, Nancy knew it, Charlie knew it. Charlie was talking about the day afterwards, man. <laughs> you know, he opened his mouth. Boy, they jumped on him. Mm -hmm. I knew they would. When I seen him in the newspaper, I knew they was going to. I'm like, Charlie, God, no. <laughs> Do 
you ever talk about Saudi Arabia? Do you ever do you ever talk about where the money came from? Mm -hmm. No. He said that there was um, many rich people with his background that funded what they do. Really? Yes. And there was somebody that lived in the United States, in Florida. I don't know who it was, but he was supposed to have a lot of money, and he was from one of those countries over there. But I know he gave them a lot of money. Um, so I let him have my phone number, and he called me one day, and he told me that he just got evicted from this house where the seven other people were living in Northport. I seen it because I helped him move his stuff out of there. And he asked me to find him another apartment where he could just rent a room and he didn't care as long as he had a desk. He didn't even care if he had a bed as long as he had a desk. He, this is what he told the lady too that he rented the uh, bedroom from in Northport for that week. So you helped him move from the house in Northport to that yeah. one week rental? Yeah, and uh. he asked me to talk to him because he didn't like American women. She happened to be the one renting the the apartment, and I'm like, okay, how are you not going to like American women? But you're talking to me, and I'm about as American as you can get, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, he was just like, well, I don't translate very well with them, and and he was kind of curt and rude with her. And she told him when the time came to um, pay the rent, to put it in an envelope and stick it in the freezer. Did you find the house in Northport that? that they lived in that you helped them move out of into that one bedroom apartment for a week? I Remember where it say, was? I want to say like if you're heading from Venice into Northport, you're going to pass Ingle, the thing to go off to Inglewood, you're going to go past that. There's like a gas station. I don't remember if it's okay. Shell or what, but there's a gas station right here. And then there's a shopping plaza right here, and there's a road that goes in between. It's right in that area. Mm -hmm. So he was living there with seven guys? How big was it? It was big inside. Oh, my gosh. It was huge. It, it didn't look that big from the outside, but when you walked in, it was just immense. It one, was beautiful. One level or two? It was one level. Nicely furnished? Mm-hmm. Very expensively furnished. Was it their furniture? It was the ladies. It was the ladies, and I mean, it had, it, it was just beautiful, it really was. Why it did had, this lady kick him out? I don't know. He said because she wanted her house back. But, you know, if she's getting, you know, anywhere from 200 to 350 450 whatever she was charging him. I know it was, it was around the $200, $300 area a week from seven different people, you know. Seven people were paying 200 a week? Mm -hmm. 1400 a week to live in the house? Yeah, you, they had to pay separately for the bedroom. You were getting charged that much to have a bedroom there. The number of things that don't make sense just kept adding up. We imagine them doing a show about it on Jeopardy. Would it, would that's, it, no, that's what I don't understand. He said he was a student, but he was allowed to fly his students. He was allowed to go off on his own if he wanted to. You know, he had, like, the privileges of an instructor. Now, if you're a student and you don't have your license, how do you have the privileges of an instructor? You flew with him. He didn't fly. Oh. He sat there and told him what to do. Gotcha. He sat there and told him what to do. So he never, I never flew with him actually flying the plane. It was always Timothy, and Timothy was a really good pilot. He slid me down off the stage and was dancing with me, and um, he kissed me. Like, sort of, when he danced with me, he was, like, brushing his lips across mine and stuff, and we kind of, like, kissed, mm -hmm. and I was, mm -hmm. like, back on the stage. And Garrett had walked over to get himself a beer, and, um, and Muhammad come over there, and he tapped on my shoulder. I'm like, what the hell do you want? <laughs> he was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm fucking dancing. <laughs> he was like, well, I'm leaving. I'm like, see ya. <laughs> he was like, when are you going to be leaving? I said, when I fucking feel like it. And he, he was like, who's that? And I said, I guess he's the new one. I started dancing with Garrett. And um, we went outside because I stayed there till the club closed. I stayed there until the club closed. And um, How'd you get home? Angelina. Angelina. She had a car. I rode w up with her. So I rode up there with her. So she knew Muhammad too. Mm -hmm. How did she know? Through Olivia, because Olivia knew the big Dutch guy that lived at the Sentinel no, apartment. What did Angelina do and Olivia do? She uh, designed lingerie on the side for people. 
Uh huh. So that was like her passion. She wanted to be a lingerie designer. For fantasies and lingerie? No. How'd you get to work there? Me and Angelina was looking for new jobs. Cause we looked in the paper, and in the paper it said um, lingerie models. Right. I'm thinking, all right, and Angelina had worked off and on as a model. Right. And um, I'm like, cool, so let's go check it out. And um, we went in there and we talked to Richard, which is the man that owns it. I know, I talked to him, yeah. Yeah, we talked to Richard, and um, Richard wanted to hire me. He didn't want Angelina. My hair was hot pink at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't want he didn't want to talk to Angelina, and uh, he wanted to talk to me. He was like, "You got the profile that would work here." And when you went to apply there, were you still living with Mohammed? He was he was there, but it was right before I kicked him out. It wasn't too long before I kicked him out. Uh huh. So it was like. Maybe as soon as you started week. making good money there, like he was gone. Out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> out. Right. <laughs> On this boat ride because you know I'm in Key West. I want to see everything, so I went on this boat tour and got to see all the, you know the dolphins and stuff. It was really nice. And, um, and um, they went to Hard Rock Cafe. They said they had to meet with some people. They didn't tell me who or they didn't specify. Peter, Stefan, and Muhammad all went to Hard Rock Cafe. Right. And they were meeting with people down there. I don't know who, but somebody had flown in. And um, they said somebody had flown in in one of the little single planes um, to come speak to them. When we come back, they met up with us on the dock. They was waiting for the boat to come back. And everybody was kind of somber looking. You know, they were kind of quiet and somber. And we were walking through this... Uh, deck and with all these little shops and stuff. It's right by where they do the boat tours and stuff. There's shops over like towards the left area. There's a whole bunch of shops. There's called a chapel by the sea. And there's a little shop right there. I was looking at some little handmade necklaces and stuff. And Muhammad turned to me and he looked at me and he was like, why don't we get married? And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And he, I was like, I just met you. And he was like, well, this way I can have my visa and I can stay here. And I'm like, um, no. And Peter and Stephanie started laughing, and they said, well, this isn't the right country, Mom, and they started laughing. And uh, he got really mad at me, really, really mad at me. And I'm like, how the hell are you going to get mad at me for not wanting to marry you? I just met you, you know? I just got out of a bad marriage. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And then Linda pipes up uh, to Peter and Stephanie, and she was like, well, I'll marry either one of you two. And we went by Divas. And that was the first time I ever saw a drag queen. So I was standing there talking to them, and um, they had their pictures taken with them. And this was on the pictures that I was telling you about with the 30 rolls of film. Mm -hmm. they, they had their pictures taken with drag queens, and when they lined up to have their pictures taken, it was Peter, Muhammad, and Stefan all standing next to a drag queen. And the drag queens shoved their hands down their pants. Peter and Stefan laughed it off, but Muhammad got really angry. He got really, really angry. You know, because he was fine with taking a picture with them. And he, then after that, we, he was really, really angry. And he was mad because I was standing there talking to the drag queens. Because I thought they were really cool. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, wow. I was like, you're a drag queen. You know? He got really, really mad. And uh, he stopped at this store that's right down. It's right in between Sloppy Joe's and Divas. It's like a Cuban cigar shop. And they were buying these big, fat cigars and smoking them. Mm -hmm. And they stunk really, really bad. And we went past Sloppy Joe's, and the bartender, I was wearing a khaki skirt sport thing and a purple top that tied around my neck and in three places in the back, and it came down like a V-shape. And I had these chunky shoes on that I just fell in love with. And um, he called me in there. He said, hey, Blondie. He pointed me out, and he was like, come here. He was like, shots on me. Okay. <laughs> so we went in there, and he lined purple hooter down the bar, and there was a drag queen on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> and me on the other end, and Linda in the middle, and they were just, and um, he got really pissed about that, too. Because he told me I shouldn't drink in public. Well, I don't know who the hell you are to tell me that you're my father, you know, I'm like, I, 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 this is like when it first started, when I was like telling him, I don't know who the F you think you are, 
but you're not going to run me. Yeah. For here, you know, here and there. A little. <laughs> a few, but you were hard. Okay. <laughs> what, were they doing drugs? Yeah. They were doing drugs. Yeah, but not in front of me. Not in front of you. Because they didn't do it in front of me until I met everybody at the apartment. That you, after. What apartment? The one in Sentinel Apartments. I'm getting there. I haven't got that right. far okay. yet. Right, <laughs> okay. Right. I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> um, what, what they drugs? went into the room that they had locked down that they rented. Right. They went in there and they said they needed to look in their manuals right. because they had a test. They were always talking about this damn test that they had, but it never came up. Mm -hmm. You know, they was always looking in these freaking manuals and, you know, studying what was supposed to be, I guess, the test material, but there was never any test. Okay. You know, I mean, they had he had been studying. So how'd you know? How'd you know they were doing drugs in there? Well, after they introduced me to this stuff and showed it to me, I. You can, you know, you can tell different characteristics that somebody oh, has. I couldn't understand why their jaw was going like this. Right. You know? I didn't know what the hell it was, and they started chewing gum. So they're all know? doing drugs in Key West, but yeah, you know. Yeah, and then I found out later that once you do coke, that makes your jaw grind yeah. like that. And that's why they would chew the gum so it wasn't so noticeable. Mm-hmm. So. And then they, after they got out of that room, for some reason, they would all, before they put the gum in their mouth, they would go brush their teeth and wash their faces and stuff. You know, I thought that was a little bit weird, but I didn't know what it was. So, And then they put the gum in their mouth and start chewing the gum. So we got back from Key West, and um, that was when they introduced me to everybody in the apartment. That was the first time I went over there. And um, that's when I met Angelina and Olivia, and the big Dutch guy, but I can't remember what his name is for the life of me, but he's huge. He's like seven feet tall. He's monstrous. I can't remember his name. Um, he was a friend of Olivia's and he had lived at that apartment with them. And um, Peter, Stefan, um, Timothy, and this is when I met Timothy too. And um, I already met Yur again. I had seen Timothy but I was never actually talked to him, you know. Um, and there was some other guy that lived there, and he had dark hair, and he looked kind of like Muhammad, but he was like, um, he had real long hair, real long hair, and um, he said he was from France, he was real quiet. So when did Muhammad ask yeah. you to get an apartment with him? How long had you been back from Key West? I'll bet it wasn't Three long. Three days. Yeah. He asked me if I would um, find an apartment to split rent with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. I wanted an out from Robert. Right. So he was like open opportunity for me to run and never look back. And um, so we went to, I found Sandpiper Apartments. I was the one that looked for those. Right. You know, so I found Sandpiper and I met Charlie and I thought he was really nice. I liked Charlie a lot. And we went in there. And I filled out the paperwork, and I talked him into, um, he used a check to pay for the apartment, and the check that he used was in, um, in the name Muhammad, and I thought the last name on there was that A-R-A-J-A-K-I or whatever it mm -hmm. was, but I only seen an A. I don't know, maybe, because right. they found bank accounts. I know they told me they found bank accounts all over the place that he had. Nancy says Muhammad beat you three times. The third time of which was the last fight he threw, sh threw his shit over the thing down under the asphalt below. She heard two really loud arguments, you know, and then I guess saw you with bruises. Did he hit you? Yes, they left bruises. Really? You know? Yes, yes, we got into three very nasty arguments. Okay, yeah. The so first she... one was over the way um, he talked to me. Right. The second one was over religion. Really? Yes. And the third one, I don't even remember what it was about. I think because that's after I had already had Garrett at our apartment. Right. You know, and I had slept with Garrett. Did, did he argue over how you dressed when you went to work? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And even when we went out to a club. Looking sexy. Yeah, because I wore little bitty clothes. I was, you know, I was thin and, uh, you know, I was going to wear what I wanted to wear. What I thought looked good. So... He would argue with me about that too. There was 
three very nasty arguments. And the last time was when I threw a shit on the landing. <laughs> and then... Over, um, over the railing down onto the asphalt. Yep. I didn't carry it down. And where was he when you did this? He was gone. He oh. was gone. He had, um... Where did he go? I don't remember where he went, but he had taken food out of the freezer. I think he went to the Sentinel apartment. Because he, he took food out of the freezer. I waited for him to leave through a shit down the landing because I had asked Charlie before how I could do it. And Charlie told me to do it that way. So that's what I did. And then right after that was when all my cats ended up killed. They how many cats? She had a litter of six, and only one survived. And the mama was gutted on my kitchen table. And I found little baby cat parts all over the place. He told me that he'd get even with me. He was like, you won't get away with this. That's pretty fucking weird. And all my cats ended up dead. The only two that survived was my little dog, and he hid under my couch, and my Siamese cat, she hid, on, she always sat on top of my fridge anyway. She sat on top of my fridge behind the cookie jar, and when I came in from work, um, my friend Paige was with me, and she helped me pick up little baby cat parts. Six dead kittens, their heads cut off? All the body parts everywhere. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I've seen, I seen little bitty legs and everything. No, awful. No, 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 no. And the only one that survived I was a little cream colored boy. kitten, and I heard this real faint meow, no. meow, meow, meow. And I picked him up and I took him outside, no, and my friend Paige had to clean it up. I couldn't do it. When you called the police, did you tell them you thought it was Muhammad, Ada, Muhammad that did it? Yeah. And they were just like, well, there's nothing we can do. We don't know where he's at. They said he was still around, but nobody knew where he was at. The important thing here, for what you saw, is that the basic investigative tool that an investigator has is a chronology. And the chronology that was released about the 9-11 hijackers is full of shit. They were not where... Uh, that the key ones, Mohammed Atta, was not where the FBI said he was when they said he was. I can't tell you why they lied about that, but I think it's curious that they did. So listen, thank you all for your attention. It's been great. It's been wonderful to meet people that care about the same things I do.